you had a good afternoon. If you have your Bibles tonight, and I hope that you do, turn to Hebrews chapter 12, and let's look at verses 1 through 3. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. We don't know who wrote the letter to the Hebrews. Some have thought maybe Barnabas wrote Hebrews. Some have thought maybe Apollos wrote Hebrews. More people think if they put a, an author to it, it would have been the Apostle Paul. We really don't know for sure who wrote it, but we know that it came from God. We know that it certainly, there's nothing in it that conflicts with anything else in the New Testament. And there's much to be learned from this epistle that we call the letter to the Hebrews. Sometimes we get discouraged. <clears throat> we all get discouraged. And when we think of discouragement in the context of the lesson tonight, we think of discouragement in the sense that we might struggle with our Christianity. We might struggle with being faithful, being true, staying the course, as they say, you're probably familiar, most of us, older brethren anyway, are probably familiar with the story of the little engine that could, and perhaps sometimes you feel like the little engine that couldn't. So you might want to give up. You might want to give up trying, and you get discouraged. It might just be for a day. It could be a period of time that you go through that you start wondering if it's really worth all the fight, all the effort to be a Christian. I have a feeling that a lot of the people who received this letter felt that way. There are many things to be learned from Hebrews, and at times the writer is very, very stern and very to the point on faithfulness. But in these passages tonight, you know that he's making uh, his response to that list of the faithful in chapter 11. <coughs> When he says in verse 1 of Hebrews 12, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnare us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now our key verse tonight is verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility for, from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Discouragement is something that happens on the inside. It, it, it affects your emotions, your thinking, and can even it can affect us physically. Discouragement is something that can really hinder us in our walk, and as the writer uses it here, in our race that we're trying to run for the Lord. Sometimes you get discouraged over different things. It could be something that happened, or something maybe that you wanted to happen that didn't happen. Something that happened to you personally, or something that happened to someone you're close to, and you're affected by it something that happened to the church as a whole, or just something maybe that even happened at work, and you may be questioning if God is really with you and on your side. There are a lot of things, obviously, that were taking place with these Hebrew Christians that received this letter that was caught, they were causing them to want to leave Christianity and, in some senses, just fall away altogether. In some cases, 
go back to the old way, to the Jewish system. Nonetheless, they became discouraged at some point and wanted to change their course of action. So we have in the first place an idea of some weary and discouraged Christians. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now we're going to look a little later about the fact that the writer points them to Jesus, but let's talk about a few other things first. And we see that this this epistle probably is summed up, if you look in chapter 13 and verse 22, The writer seems to be calling all of this the word of exhortation. To exhort is to to call someone to to implore them, to, to, to seek to make something more serious in their lives, to be more serious with the Lord, to exhort to repent, or to exhort to be stronger. Sometimes the word exhortation, however, can mean solace, or comfort. It's a broad term that can have several applications. And I'd like to use it tonight with regard to comfort and solace and encouragement because don't you and I need encouragement as we seek to walk the Christian life? It's easy to get down. It's easy to get down in the mouth. And as you think about it with regard to the soul, to get down in the heart. Clearly, some of these Christians were discouraged and they needed encouragement and there are even some that you read about in chapter 6 that were ready to give up we don't want to as God's people get to the point to where we would give up every now and then you're going to get down about something something will get under your skin or get into your heart that will cause you to be down And you know that you never leave the Lord, you never leave the church. But even so, if you get too too discouraged to a certain point, you can stop your work. You can cease to express concern. And in that sense, you can to a degree become inactive and even come to the assemblies of the saints. God doesn't want us to be, be discouraged in any form to the point that we're not actively serving Him. So hopefully these thoughts tonight... Will, will help us. Notice in the first place that the author here encourages these Christians to run with endurance the race that is set before them. It's so easy to quit. It's so easy to give up. It's so easy to stop. Ellie has been running some little races from time to time and This last one she ran in, I don't know how many people were in the race, but she was in the top 25. She wouldn't have been in the top 25 if she dropped out. She would not have even been in the race. She wouldn't have finished if she had quit. God doesn't want us to give up. What we're looking at here as far as this race is concerned, it's not a sprint. We did that, I remember, in what we called junior high when I was in school, and it'd be a sprint. And like a 50-yard dash, I think they called it. This is not that. This is a long race. It's a long-term race. It's a lifetime race. And you just set a certain pace, and you keep that pace until the end of your life or until the Lord comes again. Then the writer reminds the readers that suffering can indeed be a normal thing. I think if we get the idea as God's people that we're never going to suffer, that we're never going to go through something difficult, then something difficult comes along. We don't know how to deal with it. But you're going to suffer. You're going to struggle as a Christian. A person who runs a race is going to struggle. They're going to struggle with their muscles, with their breathing, with the blood flow in their bodies, and in a spiritual sense, we're going to struggle. And so he reminds us here that we are at times going to struggle due to persecutions. Now, I used to read these passages, brethren, with regard to the chastening of the Lord, and I didn't know what they meant. I didn't know how God could chasten me. He's up in heaven and I'm down here. He's a spirit being and and I'm a physical being. How does God chasten me? Well, if you read this, he says, number 
in verse 4, that you have not yet resisted to bloodshed striving against sin. That's an implication of persecution. It ties in with what the writer said in verse 3 with regard to Jesus receiving hostility against Himself. He's talking about persecution then. The context helps us understand it. So Lord, are you allowing persecution to make me better? Absolutely He's doing that. Notice He says in verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation that speaks to you as to sons, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. And that's a a quote from Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11. Well, we know when we read the Scriptures that the Bible has the capacity to rebuke. We know that Paul instructed Timothy to reprove and rebuke and exhort with all longsuffering and teaching in 2 Timothy chapter 4. But here we could also be talking about persecution that in a sense that God allows that to chasten us. Didn't Jesus tell us in the Sermon on the Mount in the last of the Beatitudes that you're blessed if you're persecuted? That if you're, that you're accused falsely for His name's sake? That persecution is expected of a child of God? And also it reminds us that, that we need to be strong even under even under persecution. Notice the writer says, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by Him. Sometimes God says things to us, or preaching may say things to us that we don't want to hear. But if it comes from God's Word, then it comes from God Himself. I must listen to it and not be discouraged, but be encouraged by saying God's trying to help me. He's trying to make me think better, to to act better, to feel better, and to be encouraged inside so that I can be more functional through and through. But notice that the writer uses athletic language with this race. It requires heart and it requires endurance. You cannot quit. We also see that Suffering here, as it's mentioned here, it's a normal thing. And this quote even comes from Proverbs, the writer being Solomon, chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. And if you tie it in contextually with chapter 11, people in chapter 11 suffered for their faith. And there's a lot of writing about that at the very end of the chapter that that even some were sawn in two. And tradition says that Isaiah the prophet was literally sawn in two for speaking for God. And God says, don't despise the chastening of the Lord. And I think about that and I think, well, if I'm going to be persecuted, I go, back, I go up there and I read verse 4. I've not resisted the bloodshed yet. And I hope that I never have to, but I should take it if it comes as a child of God. There is, however, the possibility of drifting away. I had the fortunate experience of growing up on a lake. I moved to South Georgia and I was looking for Chickamauga Lake. Well, it's, it's not here. And this little lake over here at this park, that's a pond compared to Chickamauga Lake. It's huge. They dammed up that river in 1939 and they made Nickajack Lake and Chickamauga Lake Acres and acres of water. I've been around boats all my life. And whenever we would take our houseboat, we had had a boat in the family for years, we'd, we'd tie it to the dock when we'd go get gas or if we'd have to stop and go in a little store for something. Daddy would say, make sure you tie it up good, Roger, because we don't want it to drift away. And he taught me how to do that. And, that, and a storm could come up, and unless it broke the rope, that boat wasn't going anywhere. But sometimes you don't get it tied very well. And I tell you, you don't want your houseboat to drift away, or any boat for that matter, and you not know about it because it gets on that river and it it could be damaged, it could be lost. Sometimes Christians drift away. They become untied. They they lose their mooring and they they drift away. Notice, if you look at chapter 2, And verse 1, the writer hits on this very, very early on. Therefore, we must give earnest heed to the things we have heard, 
lest we drift away. If a boat becomes untied from the dock, it doesn't just take off and, and go very quickly. It moves slowly away. And that's what happens to Christians sometimes. They just drift away. Have you ever found yourself drifting? Moving just a little bit away. And, and the next thing you know, as we would say with the boat, you're out in the middle of the channel. You're all alone. But you didn't get there all at once. You drifted away. The writer warns them. And what can happen, you get discouraged. Maybe because of the things that we heard have been not the way we wanted to hear them. Or they weren't said the way we wanted them to be said. But the writer says, make earnest heed to the things that you have heard. Earnest heed lest you drift away. And Christians can indeed easily drift away. But it all perhaps begins with discouragement and lack of proper attention to spiritual matters. If I sit in a pew and I'm not preaching, I'm still responsible to be a good listener. Someone else is teaching, I'm still responsible for being a good student. When I preach, I need to preach to myself too. We need to teach ourselves. We need to instruct, not because we have the mind and the capacity to put words and thoughts together and present them in a reasonable fashion, but we preachers need to hear. We need to listen, don't we? When we teach our classes, when we're teaching our children, when we sit down for our devotionals, let God speak because discouragement can come about by lack of attention to spiritual matters. And the next thing you know, we began to drift away. One of the symptoms of drifting away is lack of attendance to the assemblies of the saints. One of the symptoms. In Hebrews 10 and verse 25, the writer says that we should not be forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Notice what he says as the manner, or some translations say, the custom of some is. Some people develop the habit. How many of us really believe that people who at one time were strong, solid, faithful, at least in their attendance, all of a sudden just quit? And there wasn't something else going on. There's a reason that that happens. It, it, I just recently got on the board of Georgia Bible Camp. I've been to a couple of meetings, and I can promise you if I don't go back to any more meetings, it's because there's something I don't like about it. There's something that would cause me to be discouraged or not want to go to those meetings, and so I would just quit. But it's not the meeting necessarily. There's something underneath that. Isn't that the truth when it comes to the assembly of the saints? There's something that causes us to be disheartened, to be discouraged, or even to be tempted. And that's just a symptom of a deeper problem. And you notice that the writer makes that very clear in verse 26. If we sin willfully, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin And I believe that forsaking the assembly is a sin, but I believe the willful sin is deeper than that. That these brethren got discouraged, they got disheartened, something drew their attention away, and so the failure to attend was a symptom of something else. And it's important then, as you see, we will look a little later at the answer, but it's a serious symptom. Now we know that it's not acceptable to just not come, unless we're sick and there's some uh, reason, misfortune that occurs uh, one way or for one reason or another. So we know we should be here. But there's something that needs to be seriously considered by these Hebrew Christians. I believe the writer hits on some of this in chapter 6. Because, And I'm not jumping around. I'm trying to see a pattern of thought and problematic problems here when he says in verse 1 of chapter 6 therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ let us go on to perfection that is to maturity 
not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. And then he goes into something that has happened already to some of God's people. Verse 4, he says, It is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come if they fall away. Noticed earlier he talked about people drifting away. Now he talks about people falling away. There comes a point where you fall away. He says, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, what are they doing? I don't know the writer, if it was Paul or who, but I asked the author, what were they doing? They crucified for themselves afresh the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. They have turned back to a life of sin. It's the willful sin that he's talking about in chapter 10 and verse 26. Something has gotten hold of these people and they have fallen away. The writer is saying, don't let that happen to you. Don't get so discouraged that you drift away. Don't get so discouraged that at some point you're not drifting anymore. You're falling. You're you're leaving the Lord and you're going back to the lifestyle that you were in before. And, and of course, we could have a deeper discussion on, on what all chapter 6 is talking about, but we know that he's reminding them, look at verse 9, but we, beloved, but, but beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. So we know he's talking to some who are still, they're holding on, but maybe, maybe they're weak, they're discouraged, and maybe the, they're about to let go. They're drifting away or they're getting to the point where they might fall away. Don't let that happen to you. You can see what's happened to some already. And they're guilty of crucifying the Son of God afresh. And they put Jesus to an open shame. Don't let it go that far, the writer's saying. Don't get so discouraged that you would allow that kind of thing to happen in your life. In view, then... Of these things, we see the warnings that He gives. In view of the chastening of the Lord, we see in verse 12 of this same chapter, do not become sluggish. Don't get sluggish and slow down and and lose heart and get so discouraged that, that you think about quitting. And so we then we begin to look <clears throat> at some solutions. He gives a warning in chapter 3 and verse 12. This is where the writer gets very pointed. He says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What do you do about it? He says to exhort one another daily while it is called today. There is a need for exhortation. This is a word of exhortation that the writer gives to us. And you see it in chapter 13 at the end of the book. It's a word of exhortation. I don't know about you, but as a child of God, I need to be exhorted. I need to be encouraged. There are times I need to be rebuked so that I can be faithful. And there are brethren that help me do that. I'm thankful for brethren that will tell me when I'm going the wrong way, aren't you? And that you're, you're moving the wrong direction, Roger. You don't really want to, as we say in modern vernacular, we don't want to go there. We don't want to move in that direction. And when do we need to do it? We need to do it today. While it is still called today, the writer is telling us while there's still time and opportunity. Sometimes those opportunities come but once. And that's the time to do it. And so when we see brethren who are struggling, we need to exhort, to encourage. Lest lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. The last part of verse 13. In chapter 3 and verse 13, we see verse 12. Number one, beware of hardening. Number two, be busy in exhorting one another daily. 
The third thing I would say is be mindful that there is indeed rest at the end of the journey. Notice verse 9. There remains therefore rest for the people of God. But it's not here. The rest is not here. We don't have that yet. Now we get to lie down at night and sleep, but we get up the next day, and as they say, they, 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 they say in Hispanic countries, in their language, to the battle, to the battle, every day. And they know that it's a battle against sin every single day. There will one day come a rest, but it's not here. It's not now. It's in the future. But you live for that rest, do you not? Is was it Revelation fourteen thirteen? Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, that they may rest from their labors. But you don't get the rest on this earth. It comes later. But you look forward to it. Don't you look forward at the end of a hard day to coming home and taking your shoes off and maybe go ahead and get your shower and get cleaned up and, and get your supper and just sit down and rest? Go to bed at a reasonable time. There's nothing much better than a good night's rest. And we get that physically, but on this earth, we're going to battle again every day. It will come some, there will come someday that rest. Number one, number two, we, um, number four here, we see in chapter five, we need to get back in the Word. We have an exhortation again. Notice chapter 5, beginning with verse 11, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you've come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. There's a need to get back on the spiritual nourishment that gives us the strength to run the race, that gives us the ability to endure. These are the solutions. Some brethren need milk. Some brethren need meat. You know what you need. You know what it takes to strengthen. You read and study that which gives you the strength because if you get involved in something you don't understand, you might give up. If you spend your life only drinking milk, you'll never grow. There's a need to find what you need to consume that will give you the strength to keep running and have the maturity that you need. Also in chapter 6, in verse 12, we've already, we've already noted this in another place. But notice he says that you do not become sluggish, but do what? Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. There are brethren that I've known in my life when I've gotten discouraged and I look at brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so and I see how steady they are. Solid. Always seeming to be strong and, and they may not be always what they appear but they appear to be strong and I imitate them. They're always working, always serving, doing something for the Lord. Imitate those people, the writer says. They'll give you encouragement. Don't imitate the sluggish. Imitate those who are going forward. Find people that you can pattern your life after so that you don't give up. Remember also God's promise to Abraham and Abraham's patient endurance beginning with verse 13. Same chapter, chapter 6. For when God made a promise to Abraham because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, Surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Look at Abraham. A man who was faithful to God all of his life. I can't help but think of Joshua in Judges 2 and verse 7. The people served God all the days of Joshua. He was this man that you could imitate. We need to find the Abrahams and the Joshuas in the church. The faithful like Timothy's mother and grandmother, Lois and Eunice. 
faithful, strong Christian women that are running the race. One of my dear friends lost her mother recently, and we grew up together in Chattanooga. And I knew her mother, Jeanette Wilkerson. And Jeanette was one of these people everybody knew, and all they could talk about were all the things that Jeanette Wilkerson did in her life as a Christian. Well, she left somebody to imitate. And I knew her when I was just a boy, and we grew up together. And and I imitate people like that, that hold to it, that never stop running, that never take their eyes off the goal and keep running for the Lord. The next thing we should do is chapter 10, verse 24, we ourselves stir up love and good works. If I get involved in stirring up love and good works, I'm not going to be discouraged. I'm going to be encouraged. I'm going to be strengthened. I'm going to be challenged myself. I'm going to challenge others. And I will not give up the fight. I will not quit. Review all those heroes of the faith in chapter 11. Think about them. Read that chapter when you get discouraged and say, well, if they can do it, so can I. If they were able to do these things by faith, I can do these things by faith. I can receive the promise that Abraham received. I can make it to the end of the line, to the end of the race. Finally, we see an example, the perfect example in chapter 12 and verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. What did Jesus do? Well, for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. The writer does not say that the cross was a joy. He says the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. What was the joy before Jesus? I can think of several things. One would be His own resurrection. The fact that He knew that He would come from the grave the third day. The other would be the fact that He knew that the effect of His his death and burial and resurrection would have an impact on the lives of others and they would have eternal hope for what Jesus did. That's the joy He looked for. And so Jesus had hostility against Himself. Jesus suffered persecution, but He looked past that because He knew something better was coming. Don't you, don't I, don't we need to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. He despised the shame, but where is He now? He sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Heaven is our home if we're faithful. Eternal life is ours if we're faithful. And even though he had hostility from sinners against himself, he reminds us in verse 3 again, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You look at him, and in verse 3 says you consider him. You do a little more than look. You look at his example, then you consider him. And you see how that can have an impact on your very life. And then in chapter 12 and also in verse 13, I'm seeing people on a journey who are walking and they get tired and their hands hang down and their knees are weak and they want to quit physically. You think of the physical experience then you make a spiritual application. Sometimes we get weak kneed spiritually. Our hands hang down and we just we just don't we don't have it. We give up, we get discouraged. The writer says you look unto Jesus, you consider him, and then we see in chapter twelve and verse thirteen Notice verse twelve strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, so that what is lame may not be dislocated. We know that he's using a spiritual application with a physical analogy. That a runner's knees can get weak, and you know that runner's knees do get weak. We know that they have problems with their knees and with their legs, and and you can get so tired you can't even hold your hands up. And he says, you strengthen the hands which hang down, and the feeble knees make straight paths for your feet. I read in that when he continues to say, so that what is lame may not be dislocated, but rather be healed. Keep going forward. If a runner gets off course, is he going to win the race? 
If we get distracted from the race that we're running, are we going to win the race? Are we going to get involved in something else? It makes straight paths for your feet. I'm convinced that part of that has to do with applying God's Word, but you yourself have to make up your mind whether you're going to run straight or not. God can't do that for you. That's a decision we have to make, that we're going to keep running straight. And if I'm going to run to the end of a race, I don't want to run all over the place. I want to go straight. That'll make the course a lot shorter. It'll make it a lot more precise. So keep, keep your eyes on Jesus, make your path straight, and keep running. We have this perfect example in chapter 12, in verse 2, setting your eyes on Jesus. I want you to picture yourself as being one of these Hebrew Christians, and you're seeing maybe some of the people like we read about in chapter 6 who have quit. They've just given up. They've gone back into a life of sin. You may see some others who are beginning to drift away. We can do one of two things. We can see those people and we begin to drift away ourselves. And the next thing you know, like we read in chapter 6, we can fall away. Or we put our eyes on Jesus. Because Jesus never fell away. Jesus never quit. He never stopped. He never got distracted. He never got discouraged. He stayed within His Father's plan and stayed with it until he died, even though he despised the shame, what did he do? He looked to the joy that was set before him, even though he despised the shame, because he knew that the third day he would be raised again. He knew that he would sit at the right hand of his Father. And I need to remember that we have the same promise ourselves. That if we're faithful, one day we'll hear the voice of the Son of God and come forth. Some will... Inherit eternal life. Some will be receiving judgment. John 5, 28 and 29. Discouragement. It happens. And you start thinking about it. And if you start thinking about the negatives, you get a negative mindset, then you start going in that direction. And you forget the promises of God. You forget the hope that's given to us. And you get off course and next thing you know, you're like the, the boat that became untied from the dock and you're drifting. And next thing you know, you can fall away. All over being discouraged. All over being discouraged. And the writer reminds us once again, for consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, lest you become weary and discouraged. Watch it. Verse 3, chapter 12. In your souls. It happens within. I want to thank the Hebrews writer for this letter. I know it came from God. I know all the Scripture did, but I'm thankful for this letter because I can take it one of two ways. I can see it as a letter of rebuke and I can become upset about it or I can see it as a letter of encouragement. And isn't it interesting how the writer begins laying down the fact that Jesus is the only one worthy of paying serious attention to. That, that, that He was the Son of God. Not only that, but God Himself. Thinking about the lesson tonight, we had some come in and we start our service at 5, so I'm sorry you missed most of the lesson. But we've been talking about encouragement tonight. And I want to ask you, what direction are you heading? Are you going straight forward? Are you going with courage? Is something pulling you away from the Lord? Is something distracting you from what God would have you to think about? Distracting you from your goal of heaven? Distracting you from time in the Word? Distracting you from not spending time with God's people? Distracting you from stirring up love and good works? Distracting you from the goal of heaven itself? Don't let it happen. Don't let it happen. Jesus didn't. 
And I know if, if the writer uses him as an example, I can follow him all the way to glory. We can do it. Discouragement. Don't let it happen to you. Because we see what happened to some that they got to the point that it was impossible to renew them again under repentance. Unfortunately, some people died that way. We don't understand sometimes why some people won't listen. But I'm not going to be one of those people. I am not going to get that discouraged. I will not allow that to happen to me. If you need the prayers of your brethren tonight in any way to be strengthened, to have courage for forgiveness, to be stronger, we encourage you to come as we sing this song in a moment. If you need tonight to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He died for your sins according to the Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 3, that Jesus Himself commanded that we repent lest we perish, Luke 13 and verse 3. And Peter preached that on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And along with that he said, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You may need to become a child of God tonight. Don't let the devil discourage you from either of those decisions if you need to make them as we stand and as we sing. Have you a heart that's weary? Yeah.